Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're glad that you joined us today to look into the Word of God. Let the Word of God look into us. We're still continuing on our series, The Conduct of the Church and Leadership, as Paul writes Timothy concerning the Ephesian Church. And today our subtitle is looking at this whole idea of the doctrine of elders. Now, we know that there has been a time when we're trying to encourage the different people groups and to encourage what the Lord is trying to say to Paul, to Timothy, and also to the Ephesian church. And so we need to be willing to see that and understand it and then apply it to our lives. Amen. So today we're looking at this whole idea of an elder. The elders in the church, they can be known also as overseers or sometimes uh, an apostle that can be used there. We have an apostle, which can mean elder, overseer, even missionary, that idea. Uh, someone who has vision and oversight concerning a local church. And so God is going to, or Paul is going to speak. To Timothy how to deal with elders in the local church and there's both the positive and negative side when it comes to elders what I mean by positive and negative there is a ways that we should encourage our elders and there is ways that we also need to make sure that they are disciplined too they're not outside of any type of discipline but they also need to be instructed you know one thing about leadership, leadership is always an uh, an ongoing uh, growth process. You know, once you become the, the pastor or leader of a church, that doesn't mean that you can stop growing. That means that there is just more responsibility and that you need to keep growing. You need to, to get involved in, in understanding of what the Lord is wanting to use you and teach through you to others. And also that as an elder or overseer, we need to be careful that we take time to not only oversee other people's lives, but that we make sure we oversee our own lives, that we're walking according to what the Lord would have us to do. So Paul is writing a number of verses uh, concerning this issue. And so let's go over into 1 Timothy as we're going to start at verse 17 and, and look at a number of points concerning an elder. And again, uh, I think the, one of the best ways to sort of explain an elder, the, I, the concept of an elder, is that he oversees uh, what's going on in the congregation. Not oversee in that necessarily a way of controlling, but has taken time to see what's going on uh, amongst the people. And so you can also say, if you want to put a synonym in there, uh, that an elder is also a shepherd. A shepherd is overseeing the flock and knows what's going on, knows where the enemy is trying to attack, knows if a lamb gets lost. All these kinds of things. And sometimes I say to people, especially to pastors, if you really want a job description from the Bible of what it means to be an elder or a pastor, study Psalm 23. It gives you a lot of important information. And we talk about that in our Disciples' Principles of Faith, that, that there is a need for elders to be an overseer. And... The problem with elders sometimes and pastors, depending on what denomination you're in, uh, a lot of times the pastors are the only elders. And then there's other churches that they will have pastors who are, you know, elders uh, who are giving uh, um, oversight in the church. But then they will have an elder board. And then some denominations won't have an elder board, but they'll have a deacon board. And then some uh, associations or groups will have pastors as elders. They'll have an eldership board and they'll have a deacon board. 
And so it's interesting to see how different denominations have, or associations, have kind of worked out this whole eldership. Um, then you'll get into churches now. There's a big thing now going on where the pastor is not, he's part of an elder team and he's not no more uh, the head elder or sometimes it will, you know, there, there's all kinds of, of new names that are kind of floating around to call what the elders are or what the pastors would be. And so, but the key thing is here is just to remember they're giving oversight and uh, giving direction like a shepherd would for the sheep. So in verse 17, as we begin to pick this up, he says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And this, again, the idea of honor is respect, uh, lift up, and acknowledge. And now Paul says, those who are ruling well, those who are really doing well as an elder and are really helping uh, the sheep and are watching over the sheep, you know, that give them double honor. Show them respect and and uh encourage them but also this whole idea of double honor kind of shows up in the next verse that not only honor them with words but honor with them with needs what i mean by needs they have financial needs they have to be looked after they have to pay bills like everybody else and if they're working full-time and serving full-time as an elder just like a shepherd would be paid to look after the sheep, you know, elders should be looked after and taken care of also. And so I, when Paul begins to talk about this, it says those who rule well, you know, that we should count them worthy as double honor. And, you know, we should do more for them than we would just do for any other kind of person that may be around us. Bless them especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. And so, uh, you know, I mean, there's been historically, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's been little sayings, you know, that the congregations, you know, want to make sure that, that their, their pastor is, does, keeps being humble. And so they want to make sure that he, you know, if you don't pay him enough, well, maybe he will pray more and maybe he will uh, work harder. And there's, I've seen so many things going on over the years. And I thank God that, first of all, that as an elder, we're under the headship of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he does take care of our needs and does watch over us. But on the other hand, I've seen a lot of congregations not take care of their overseeing pastor or elder to the place that they have to work two or three or who knows how many extra jobs on the side to be able to meet the needs. Now, I understand some of that if you only have a very small congregation, you know, but often uh, the, the it, it seems like the pastor does a lot of the sacrificing and the congregation does a lot of the pleasure journey walk <laughs> and so when paul because he goes on and says here for the scripture says paul says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages this is what jesus taught the laborer is worthy of his wages take care of them look after the elder you know and and the reason why it gives this this scripture that talks about don't muzzle the ox, you know, while it's treading out. You know, people were afraid, well, if an ox is treading out the grain, breaking the, the chaff away from the, the actual flesh of the seed, uh, the, that you don't want to waste any grain. And so uh, some people would put a muzzle, you know, so that the, the ox couldn't eat in the grain that he's walking on. And the Bible is teaching, don't do that. You know, they're working hard. They're trying to work in the whole area of, of, of breaking up the grain so that it may be ready for, for use. And if the ox gets hungry, let them eat. 
And so Paul is using this this illustration of the ox to remind the church and Timothy that the elders, those who are hardworking, those who are uh, laboring in the word and doctrine, it's noticing here he's saying that they're they're studying in the word, they're getting in the word, and they're also not only in the word, but they're teaching sound doctrine. That Paul continues to bring up that word doctrine. Here it is again, that they would, you know, teach sound doctrine to the people. Well, then don't muzzle them. You know, give them uh, provisions so that they can uh, take time to do what needs to be done. Now, there's an issue sometimes in the modern days that the pastor now is not so much one who studies word and doctor, doctrine. He often come, becomes the CEO of a large corporation. And so now he is paid to make sure the corporation succeeds and that the corporation is doing okay. And if he has oversight over the corporation. Uh, the problem with that is, is it's not very biblical. The oversight is to have oversight amongst the people, amongst the sheep. Get out to where their jobs, get out to where they're working, get out to where they're living. And uh, one pastor asked me a long time ago, how can I see the church grow? And I just said, pray, get into the word, and get out of your office. <laughs> get out amongst the people. Because people really love it when the shepherd is around. The sheep really love it, you know. You take animals and maybe this is a very poor illustration but you got dogs and cats they love when their master is around when the when the owner is around they love it and people are no different we love when the elder is around and so i've tried to say well people say well there's enough not enough time in the day to go out and visit well you can break it all down and you can begin you know when I used to do this, I, I did a lot of church planting. And there, and people would say, how do those churches grow? Again, I went and visited. And it was interesting that some of those places that I visited had never, for 30, 40 years, or never, ever had a pastor on their property. I remember going to this one lady, this place, or I didn't know it was a lady at the time, knocking at the door, door cold turkey, and just say, hey, I'm a local pastor in the community can i pray for you and is there anything you want me to pray for and she just stood there crying and i thought oh boy i really upset her and then finally she just said to me you know you're the first one that has ever come to my house and asked me how i'm doing and what can be prayed about that's what an elder is all about and so but we need to take care of them so they can do those kinds of things but then he goes on and do not, he says, verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except for two or three witnesses. So now when Paul is not only saying, bless the elders, but he's also saying that if you're going to make accusations, maybe he's done something wrong or said or whatever, then you should, if you're going to confront him, confront him with two or three people, sit down with them and talk with them about the issue. Don't just go as one person and think well i'm right they're wrong and then you go and try to straighten them out but paul says no go with two or three witnesses so that the, that the idea of witnesses that things can be established for those who are sinning rebuke them in the presence of all that the rest also may fear so if you've got an elder that has gone into a lifestyle of sinning and you say, well, can an elder do that? <laughs> Let me tell you, it can happen and it can happen easily. If an elder doesn't get keep, keep pure to the word of God and keep into prayer and keep into the doctrines of God, he can begin to go astray also. And that's why sometimes God uses other people to be those two or three witnesses that will talk. And we'll talk to the elder. And if the elder is sinning, then bring it before all. And it's interesting. And present it before all, not only as a rebuke to the elder, saying, hey, you've been doing this. But present it to all where there's that, that, that little break in there. 
so that the rest of the congregation may be feared. That means that they realize that they're going to be held accountable. We all need to be held accountable. That's what discipline is all about. And we will all make mistakes, and some are easily seen and some aren't. But the thing is, we need to understand that we need to keep each other accountable. And especially if an overseeing elder is sinning, we need to go to him with two or three people, people who are recognized, confront them, rebuke them, and say, hey, get back on track, and then bring it before the congregation so that the congregation can know what has taken place, so they're not learning things by gossip. You know, a lot of pastors sometimes, they they resign before the stuff hits the fan, or they quit, or or they get fired, and nobody in the congregation doesn't know and next thing you know, there's all this gossip. You know, it's amazing how many times that pastors, you know, are out there and they're going through, you know, challenges. And all of a sudden they're trying to work something out. Maybe you've done some little thing wrong. And next next week they're not in the pulpit anymore and they've been fired. That's not biblical. The reality is they're part of the body of Christ. You know, again, an elder is not them and us. It's us and us. An elder in this time often was part of the congregation. That's where they lived. That's where they ate. That's where they slept. And so we're to take time to to rebuke them if they've done something wrong, but also use it as a teaching moment so that others may have fear that if they're playing around with sin, thinking that no one's ever going to confront them, they need to have the fear also that they will be confronted too. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so a lot of times, you know, we're not really walking in this part of the scriptures when it comes to the body ministry, and Paul is trying to teach them that goes on to verse 21 i charge you before god and the lord jesus christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice doing nothing without with partiality so he's saying and not only will people uh, be a witness to what's going on but also to realize that god and the lord jesus christ and even the elect angels of god they're going to know everyone that all of them are going to know so deal with it properly. To deal with it without prejudice, that the whole idea of bigotry, injustice, intolerance, you know, deal with it properly and not to show partiality. Well, and say, well, you know, this guy is, you know, he's our favorite elder and he's one of the bigger givers of our church. And so, you know, we'll just look the other way, you know. Well, would you do that same type of standard for everyone else in the church? And so we're not to show partiality. We're not to show prejudice. You know, when an elder has fallen short, we need to deal with it and bring about so it's brought clear and then not to show favoritism, but to deal with the situation. I, I mean, I'm telling you what Paul is telling Timothy to do in the Ephesian church. And I think there's going to be, when Paul's writing this letters to Timothy, there's a, there's a leadership problem in the church. A lot of the way, you know, the congregation often goes the way the leaders go. So if the leaders are watered down when it comes to the word of God or watered down become when it comes to the doctrine, so will the, the sheep be that way too. I know I'm being a little bit strong today, but... I've been an elder in a church, and I've also been an elder in a fellowship of believers. And I can understand it. it's important that we set a good testimony, that we walk the way God wants us to walk. And then he goes on, and he instructs Timothy, when you're working with elders, do something else. Verse 22, he says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. So he's warning Timothy, as you're looking out for leadership, you know, just don't think, well, this guy's nice. You know, this guy is a giving. Let's make him an elder. And I've seen that happen too many times in the church. I've seen that happen, you know, where the number, while we need seven elders and we've only got six right now, and we got two others, well, they're good enough that maybe they could be elders. So why don't we put them in? 
let me tell you, I've, I've done that and I need to confess that. And I, it, you know, you wish afterwards that you could back it up and say, no, is, you know, just because of the constitution or the aims, objects and bylaws or whatever call for seven. If there isn't seven that are worthy to be called, stick with five, stick with four, whatever, change the constitution if you have to. <laughs> But, you know, make sure that you're not laying hands on people that are not yet have, have, have come to the place that they're walking in a, in a way that honors the Lord. So that's why Paul says, take, take one's time. Timothy, don't be in a hurry to, to get these people in place. So that, cause sometimes the reason why pastors want to get people in place is because they think, well, maybe I will have less work and I can relax and, and do a few things less. No, don't lay hands on people, you know, suddenly. And not only that, but if you lay hands on people too suddenly, and you're sometimes then find out that they're in sin, you may then also become sharers of their sin. Because you didn't take the time to walk it out. And because you didn't deal with, you know, find out who they are. Next thing you know, you're caught up in their sin. And then you got problems too. And that's why Paul said, be careful how you lay your hands on people. Make sure everything is, is good, that there's a track record, there's there's maturity there. They're into the word, they're into prayer, they're into doctrine. And then, you know, yes, lay hands on them. But if you're going to lay hands on someone who is not prepared in that, you could be going along and, and investing in their sinful nature. And become part of that sinful nature. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, don't do that because you need to keep pure. And the pure idea here is to be real, authentic, honest, and genuine. You need to walk it all through, Paul is saying, in a way that you as an elder. So Paul has now, we know, we've read in the scriptures that Paul also tells Timothy, remember the prophecy and the laying on hands when you received a gift and stuff like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Also remember that when you were sent out, we laid hands probably on them to send them out to the Ephesian church because the idea of laying on hands shows that you're transferring power and authority, you know, not only of people, but also of God the Father on these people. And so he's saying, be careful. And what you do, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share other people's sin. Keep yourself pure. Don't nurture their sin any further by making them an elder, which will make you a sinner because you were involved in it. And laying on hands on them without being properly overseeing what was going on. And then we get a little bit of a change here it, it, uh, in the next couple of verses where he's specifically maybe talking about an elder, or he might even be talking about Timothy. It says, No longer drink water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for the firmament, or, or for, <laughs> I can't even say, um, infirmities, the frequent infirmities that you're having, that you may be going through. And, uh, the emphasis should be underlined here, a little bit of wine for the stomach's sake and for your infirmities. And the idea is little. It's, it's not, you know, he's not taking a bottle of wine and hoofing it all down. You know what I mean? You know, see, again, here's one of those Asian things. They didn't have the, the shopper's drug mark and they didn't have all the drug stores where you could run down and get something for this and get something for that or you know, whatever, you know, the main medicine of the day was wine. You know, and so if you ate some bad food and you didn't go get Pepto-Bismol or whatever it may be, or Tums or whatever, you know, you had a little bit of wine for your stomach's sake. And then he goes on and Paul knows, he, he's the traveler. And Paul knows that sometimes you can get infirmities. You can get all kinds of wonderful little critters that come along from traveling and eating strange food at weird places. And you can get sick or you can have other kinds of infirmities that have come upon you. 
And Paul was saying, be, it's okay, yes, drink water, but be careful. But also, you know, it's okay to go to the medicine cabinet and get out a little bit of wine and, and drink of it for your stomach's sake and for your infirmities. Not for getting rain, rid of anxiety or stress or worry or whatever else, but it was for the physical needs. And I know, you know, a lot of people use the scripture to justify why they go out and they do what they do. I'm, I'm going to leave that up to them, but I think it's something that we need to be careful of when we're an elder in the church and that we set a good example to others. I think enough said there because I'm not doing the doctrine of drinking today. I'm doing the doctrine of elders today. <laughs> and we pray that the Lord will give you clarity there. Then he goes on to verse 24. Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. So what Paul is trying to say here, because some of the men aren't aren't uh, being clear in how they're walking, uh, their their sin is becoming evident and and not realizing that th that that sin is pro proceeding them or is laying out the pathway to judgment. And as we get involved with those elders that not only would they go to judgment, but later on those who follow them, they may end up in the same judgment later. I don't know if you're getting all what's going on here, but there's a lot of connections, you know, that we need to be careful how and, and show greater awareness about the whole area of elders in the church. And so, you know, when we see that there's clear evidence that they're sinning, you know, that we need to remember that there will be judgment that will come upon them. And that not only upon them, but judgment will also come upon those who follow after them later. Sheep follow the shepherd. <laughs> you know I mean? And that's why there's a lot of things that, that Paul will tell us. You know, the reason you don't do them is not whether because you're strong enough or not strong enough to be able to, to deal with that. Is that because whatever you do, others will follow and do also. And I think that's something that we need to be reminded of as elders. You know, you might have the strength and it may not bother you and you have the, you know, the power to overcome it. That's, I can understand that. But realize that there's others who are following after us and we need to set them an example. We need to show them how to walk in the power and the presence of the Lord. Amen. And so watch that where Paul is saying to Timothy, you know, if you don't dealing with this sin in an elder, not only will they be judged, but those who follow after will also be judged. And I think a lot of you are knowing what I'm talking about, because when it comes to this whole eldership, we've been taught to look the other way. You know, don't don't become too judgmental or don't become too, you know, where you're picking everything apart and, and that. But at the same time, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, it, it, you know, they were supposed to rebuke them. They were supposed to deal with them. They were supposed to get them back on track. They were supposed to bring them before the congregation, which would cause a fear both for the, the elder and for uh, the people that they would recognize that these things are not just kept under the carpet, that but they're going to be dealt with. Then he goes on in verse 25. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident. So then he's going back to the positive side. Just like sin is evidence and you can see it and you can see the destructiveness of it and what it can do with others. He now flips it over and says, I want to just give you one more positive thing, Timothy, concerning elders. Because likewise means in comparison to the good works of some are clearly evidence. So those who are properly serving as elders, their testimony is powerfully being used in not only the church, but the community. And it brings glory to God. Amen. 
Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. So Paul was saying, come on now. People can see the negative and can, and can see the positive. Don't think, elders, those of you who are around listening to us, many listen to us every morning within the 24 hours, you can't hide your sin. It will eventually ooze out from someplace. Somebody will see it. Somebody will know about it. Some will begin to find out about it. And it can't be hidden. Deal with it. If there's issues as an elder, deal with it. People as sheep and, and congregants, if there's an issue in eldership or leadership, whatever you may want to call it, it's important that we get back to the word and we get back to doctrine. And that's what Paul was saying, the measuring stick for all. Remember we said when we talked about deacons, we talked about elders, that really the standards for deacons and elders should be the exact same standards for the disciple of Christ. And the same way that you deal with an elder is the same way we should deal with the people in the congregation. You know, one shoe or one size, I should say, fits all. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look into how Paul was trying to encourage Timothy, who was trying to encourage the elders within the Ephesian church and other churches that how to walk, how to live, how to live upright, how we as churches should look after our elders and how we should honor them and pay them. And, and Lord, also, though, we need to be careful how we make accusations against them and Lord, that we be willing to, to come to the place, all of us, to come under the discipline of the word of God and doctrine. And Father, I, I pray too that as we are selecting elders and leaders, that we will be careful that we don't, that how we select them and how we lay hands on them. And Lord, how we use the things that you put around us for health and other areas. But Father, I pray most of all that you would help us that if we've got sin in the closet, Something that is hanging around in the back that we confess it. We get rid of it. We deal with it. Because, Lord, it can't be hidden. Because how do we know that? Because you told us that God knows, that Jesus Christ knows, and even the elect of the angels know. <laughs> so, Lord, and it won't be long before other people know too. So, Lord, help us just to walk a walk that brings honor and glory to you. Cleanse us, watch us, wash us, forgive us, Lord, of our sins. And may we be, Lord, that people who have evidence that will clearly show, Lord, that the power of your spirit is in us and on us and working through us. And we give you thanks now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We had a little look at what it means to, to be an elder in the church and the doc, partial teaching concerning being a, a, the whole doctrine of an eldership. And I hope that it causes us to think a little bit more about, you know, those who accept such positions and those who are wanting to lay hands on us for that position, that we really take deeply into account that this is a position that God needs in the body of Christ, but we need to deal with it carefully within the body of Christ. Amen. We love you. Keep on keeping on. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Amen. Bye-bye for now.